Hello and welcome to World Panorama, your weekly roundup of all the top international stories. I'm Tracy Shilshi and here are the headlines. Bilateral cooperation more important than differences, says China's ambassador to India, claims India should not jump to conclusions after the first round of the strategic dialogue. An Indian techie is shot dead and another injured in a hate crime in the U.S. just days after the U.S. administration issues tough new orders to crack down on undocumented immigrants. And NASA discovers the largest batch of Earth-sized habitable zone planets. Three of the seven planets appear to be rocky in nature and to host surface temperatures capable of sustaining liquid water. Our top story, China and India held their upgraded strategic dialogue to shore up bilateral ties. This amid discussions to resolve differences over Beijing's reluctance to support India's Nuclear Suppliers Group or NSG bid, as well as a UN ban on Jaish Mohammed chief Masood Azhar. While India maintained this was a work in progress, the Chinese envoy cautioned that neither nation should rush into conclusions. Here are all the details. It's China's first official reaction after a strategic dialogue with India in Beijing on Wednesday. China says delicate issues like Masood Azhar and India's entry into the NSG will take time in getting resolved. It also said that a strategic dialogue that has restarted will decide the direction of the relations between the two countries. No, China's support to, say, to India and to every country on the anti-terrorist matter has always been there. So something in detail, the discussions are still going on and uh, it, it takes time. And okay. what do you think about NSG, sir? Yes, it's the same. It's the same. The Chinese ambassador said he was aware that media and both the nations prefer to focus on the tensions, where in fact the two nations should concentrate on cooperation. Focus on these two issues. These two emerging issues are, so impo are very important, but more important is the bilateral cooperation. The correspondent, I wish you can also cover some positive matters, some progress. Experts feel that China's position is exclusively determined by its self-interest and that it has not deviated from it even one bit after a strategic dialogue. In this context, they question the very significance of the dialogue. I can't see what is the basis of a strategic dialogue with China because, in a sense, uh, China has for long uh, been our strategic adversary. It has armed China, uh, Pakistan with uh, nuclear weapons, with missile technology that continues today. And the reason why they oppose our membership of the NSG is they have tagged it along with that of Pakistan. The reason why they are opposing uh, the designation of Masood Azhar is because it will put Pakistan in the dock. In this context, the Chinese ambassador's statement clearly reflects the inflexibility of Beijing's policy. In fact, it has refused to even acknowledge India's concern on China-Pakistan economic corridor. Given the state of affairs, India is holding the talks on these issues will continue. Akhilesh Suman's report for Raj Sabha TV. All right, to help us understand the source story further, for further insight into the relation really between India and China, we're joined uh, in studio this evening by Ravi Prasad Narayan, who's the associate professor with the Center for A East Asian Studies at JNU. Thanks for joining us here. First of all, just talking, taking away from what the envoy said, uh, that let's not rush into anything. Uh, these things take time. Uh, but, you know, we do understand that India is trying to be as uh, pushy as possible, at least on this issue. And it has full right to, of course, because it seems to be, uh, you know, it's justified in its demand for the NSG bid and for that matter, even on the ban on Masood Azhar. But China's response to it, uh, is that right on its part? China's response is predicated about its interests primarily. Mm. And it is in its interests not to allow the gate crashing into the NSG by a country like India, mm. according to sources in Beijing. Yeah. We are a responsible player when it comes to nuclear material. And I personally believe that we have to advance our case in such a manner that we have a history of having been compliant and abiding by the existing norms on uh, international proliferation, mm -hmm. 
non-proliferation aspects yes. and how we have been a rule player although we are outside the system as mm. of now. Mm. When it comes to uh, China-India relations, you should look at it and at very, very many levels, very many gra gradations here. Yeah. And you could say that constructive engagement is the need of the day and that is something which this government and maybe whichever government mm. in power will continue. Mm. It is a matter of concern that there are issues of dispute, issues of differences, and these will continue. Yeah. For instance, terrorism. Mm. When the United Nations itself has failed to define terrorism, yes. it uh, leaves a lot for us to actually wonder how far can we advance the case when it comes to trying to convince China mm -hmm. to be on our side and look at how we look yes. at terrorism. Second issue is that uh, there is need for more institutional ballast in the relationship. Mm -hmm. As of now, the institutional links are growing, yes. but they need to be more intense. Okay. There is also societal aspect because international relations is a field fertile with a lot of theoretical aspects. And these days, the buzzword is constructivism. Yes. So we need to construct an overall relationship where even society mm -hmm. is involved. And here, when I say society, I squarely mean the epistemic dialogue that needs to be fostered between the two countries. Mm. A starting point was a think tank dialogue. You know, two countries. This needs to be sustained where all issues can be dealt with in a track to mechanism. For instance, there are hundreds of uh, linkages between institutions in the United States and China. But yes. when it comes to India and China, we need more, mm -hmm. institutionally and also in societal terms. But you know, some are of the opinion that the, the, both the countries, they have had a strategic relationship at least since what, 2003, 2005, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but you know, if they look at the very, the way the relationship has been uh, for decades now, it has been more of an adversarial one, especially in recent times because of its proximity with Pakistan, uh, and some are of the opinion that these dialogues that we have, uh, you know, are at the end of the day just talks, and they don't really transform into action. They don't, they will not actually yield any results on the ground. Do you agree with that? Uh, partly, but then I also believe India is too large a country, too responsible a power to fixate our foreign policy through a Pakistan-centric prism. Yes. We need to have far many more options when yeah. we are dealing with countries like China. Mm -hmm. And uh, to begin with, we have the boundary dispute that is being dealt with at a totally different level. Yes. We also need to realize that China itself is insecure about its own rise within the international system. Mm -hmm. Recently there was talk of something called a Thucydides trap mm -hmm. where the Greek philosopher was invoked by none less than uh, Xi Jinping mm -hmm. because there has always been, I mean history keeps repeating itself we are told, yes. it does in very many ways, where a rising power comes to the attention of an established power. Mm -hmm. Now this was in the past I guess it was with uh, Sparta and Athens yes. but now it is China and the United States. Mm -hmm. So this leaves us out entirely. So we have to look at China strictly in a bilateral manner. Okay. And one thing about China is that when negotiations are conducted over a prolonged period, yeah. there has to be an element of give and take. Mm -hmm. Now, the question of give and take gets most controversial when it comes to China-Pakistan economic corridor mm -hmm. because it infringes on our sovereignty very clearly. Yes. How do we address this issue? Mm -hmm. Now, this is for the epistemic process to mm -hmm. take over and uh, give a policy feedback which would be reciprocated. So do you, do you suggest that we keep calm, uh, go on with the talking, uh, in a way of sorts allow China to, uh, you know, be the big brother of sorts if you could say so uh, and, you know, let's just see how things go because, uh, you know, there are many more facets to obviously like you, you are saying, there are many more facets to the India-China uh, dialogue and their relationship. Is that what you say? Absolutely. Mm. There are very many facets to China-India relations and uh, these are, I would say, early days because there are controversial issues and yes. there are also issues where both the countries can cooperate and work. For instance, climate change. Mm. Till 2009, both the countries were literally on the same page. Yes. There has, of course, been a slight divergence, mm. but then both the countries realized that as the largest developing countries, climate change is an issue that cannot be you know, pushed under the table mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. This requires both the countries to sit together and evolve new strategies and this is where I guess the Niti Aayog and the NDRC in China have come together mm -hmm. at one level. All right. Now declarations apart, we need more 
ingress yes. into the Chinese system and vice versa, mm -hmm. where both the countries decide to keep talking irrespective yeah. of the differences that are. The differences are many. Yes. The boundary dispute, as I mentioned before, yes. China's growing influence in the Indian Ocean. Then you also have trade disputes. China, I mean, the adverse balance of trade, more than, I think, $52 billion, 2014-15. Mm -hmm. How do we reduce this? China to open up its pharmaceutical sector for India. Now, these are issues which require a policy-centric approach from our side. Yes. And this requires the participation of very many stakeholders, not just the Ministry of External Affairs, All right. but several other specialized ministries and also a feedback from society that is par participating in the creation of policy. All right. All right. We'll have to leave it there. Ravi Prasad Narayanan, thank you so much for joining us, giving us an insight in really what uh, is, in fact, a complicated issue, uh, definitely India-China relations, and we'll keep track of developments on that front. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank Meanwhile, you. let's head on now to the U.S., where in a shocking incident, a 32-year-old Indian engineer was shot dead by a disgruntled American Navy veteran who shouted racial abuses. The Indian Embassy has said that the government is in, in, of India is closely monitoring the developments and has demanded speedy investigations by U.S. authorities. And the U.S. government, too, has condemned the attack and has assured a thorough investigation. Here's a report. A young Indian techie is the latest victim of a race crime in U.S. Kansas City. 32-year-old Srinivas Kuchibhotla was shot dead by a former American Navy veteran. The 51-year-old shooter Adam Puritan opened fire at a crowded bar on Wednesday night as he yelled terrorist and get out of my country. Kuchibhotla died of his bullet injuries in hospital while his colleague Alok Madasini was critically injured. Hailing from Hyderabad, Kuchi Bhotla was employed with the U.S. technology company Garmin's headquarters in Olathe. The attacker was caught five hours later in Missouri. Kuchi Bhotla's family is in shock. They are blaming Donald Trump for their loss. We want the body to be here earliest, at the earliest. So we are waiting. Is, this certainly shows that Trump is only the prime reason as of now. The family has also appealed to the government to take up the matter. Government should voice out this strongly because our brothers, sisters and our relatives and, uh, are there. And if you really look into this incident, this is not uh, done by a, a teenager or a burglar or something like that, a drug addict. It is, a, it is done by a 55-year-old man. Minister of External Affairs Sushma Swaraj reached out to the bereaved family and promised all help. The U.S. Embassy in New Delhi has condemned the shooting. The United States is a nation of immigrants and welcomes people from all across the world to visit, work, study and live. U.S. authorities will investigate thoroughly and prosecute the case, though we recognize that justice is a small consolation to families in grief." Unquote. The unfortunate incident is just one of the many such incidents taking place in the United States. Experts blame Trump's non-liberal approach to immigration policies as the reason behind this. And this shows that uh, there is a dangerous trend amongst some disgruntled people. Uh, the unfortunate part is that in the run-up to the election, the passions have been uh, whipped up quite a bit against immigration and foreigners. The Telangana government has promised all help to the family members of the victim. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha Television. And the shocking incident came just days after the U.S. administration issued tough new orders to start a sweeping crackdown on undocumented immigrants, putting nearly all of the country's 11 million undocumented foreigners in line for deportation. The new order makes it easier for officials to automatically expel undocumented, uh, undocumented immigrants over charges of traffic violations or even something as simple as shoplifting along with other serious crimes. Human rights activists claim this is yet another move to alienate migrants across the U.S. In a move aimed at intensifying the crackdown on undocumented immigrants, the U.S. administration issued guidelines to widen the net for deporting illegal immigrants. 
According to Homeland Security Department memos, the undocumented immigrants arrested for traffic violations or shoplifting will be targeted along with those convicted of more serious crimes. This morning, Secretary Kelly and the Department of Homeland Security released memos regarding the implementation of two of the President's executive orders that are designed to protect the homeland. These two memos provide explicit guidance to DHS staff on how to carry out two executive orders signed by the President on January 25th, one dealing with interior enforcement and one dealing with border security. Perhaps most critically, the President is empowering DHS to carry out the immigration laws currently on the books. Meanwhile, Amnesty International Group signaled out Donald Trump as an example of an angrier and more divisive politics. In a report, the group criticized several other world leaders, saying that dehumanized rhetoric was creating a more divided and dangerous world. We have ended up in this situation where human rights have been sacrificed at the altar of politics. Um, and, and the last message really is that leaders and governments are failing us. But fortunately, people are standing up. Uh, and we've seen this now in the United States with post-Trump election. But we've seen this in the Gambia and West Africa. We are seeing it in all parts of the world. And in fact, that's the call we are making to people across the world, that if you want to make a difference, this is the time to stand in the way. Stand in the way of hate and discrimination and stand for humanity. The new memos do not alter U.S. immigration laws, but take a much tougher approach towards enforcing existing measures. The orders also make it easier for officials to automatically expel undocumented immigrants. There are an estimated 11 million illegal immigrants in the United States. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha Television. Moving on now, in a thrilling discovery, NASA has found seven Earth-sized planets orbiting near a star, a combination similar to our solar system. All the planets are close in size to Earth and Venus and perhaps warm enough for water and the life that it can sustain. But scientists say that they need to study the atmospheres before determining whether these rocky, terrestrial planets could support some sort of life. Are we alone in this vast universe? While the question has bugged us since human beings started existing on Earth, we are now a step closer towards knowing the answer to that perennial question. Astronomers have found at least seven Earth-sized planets orbiting the same star some 40 light years away. This discovery outside of our solar system means finding a second Earth is now not a matter of if. But when? These planets are among the best uh, in, in, of all the planets we know to follow up, to see, for example, with the James Webb Space Telescope that we're going to launch last year, the atmospheres and also to look at biosignatures if there are any. The discovery gives us a hint that finding a second Earth is not just a matter of if, but when. So what do we know of these seven newly found planets? They were found in tight formation around an ultra-cool dwarf star called Trappist-1, corresponding to Sun in our solar system. All the planets are rocky rather than being gaseous like Jupiter. These seven planets have the winning combination of being similar in size to Earth. And most importantly, they are all temperate, meaning they could have water on their surfaces and potentially support life. So Trappist-1 is much cooler, much smaller than our sun, and so the planets it's in its habitable zone are much closer to it, very close to it, with very short orbital periods. And in the, this graphics, what you can see are the planets uh, which, are around, which were found around Trappist-1, with the three of them which are in the habitable zone, so also called the Goldilocks zones, where liquid water could exist. Although 40 light years away doesn't sound too far, it would take us millions of years to reach this star system. But from a research perspective, it is a close opportunity and the best target to search for life beyond our solar system. And here is some food for thought. When our sun dies, Trappist-1 will still be a young star and will live for another trillion years. 
So if there is another part of the universe for life to carry on, it may be in the Trappist-1 system. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. All right, time for a quick break, but still ahead, we get you all the details from Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu's visit to Singapore and Australia. influential revolutionaries of Indian freedom struggle, Shaheed Bhagat Singh. Born into a Sikh family, patriotism flowed in his blood at the age of 13. When he formed Naujawan Bharat Sabha to spread the message of revolution in Punjab. In the wake of avenging Lala Lajpat Rai's death, Bhagat Singh and his associates coined the catchphrase Inkalab Zindabad. But towards the end of their rebellion, they had to pay a heavy price for their patriotism. Following the blasts inside the corridors of the assembly, both Bhagat Singh and Batukesh Vardak caught it arrest. Bhagat Singh was sent to the gallows in Lahore with his fellow comrades, after which he was cremated in Hussainiwala on the banks of Satlaj. Welcome back. Now, in the first visit to Singapore by an Israeli head of state in 30 years, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu issued a call for greater diversity and tolerance. Singapore's Prime Minister Lee Sien Leung, meanwhile, endorsed a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, noting that it was a changed issue for, in fact, a charged issue for Muslims around the world, including the Southeast Asian nation. Here's a report. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called for further ventures between Singapore and Israel on Monday during his visit to the city-state. Singapore's Prime Minister Lee Shen Long earlier held an official welcome with the Guards of Honours on the Istana grounds, which is the official residence of the President for Netanyahu. The two leaders later sat down for talks before speaking to the media. Netanyahu praised the joint ventures the two nations embarked on and called for further cooperation to benefit both countries. We have a joint R&D fund that has uh, already funded 150 projects for uh, Israeli and uh, Singapore companies working together in a variety of fields. Uh, and I think that the opportunities are vast. We live in a technological age. The future belongs to those who innovate. Uh, Israel and Singapore are innovation nations, and together we can bring more prosperity, uh, more hope, uh, and a better life for our peoples, and I think for beyond our peoples, uh, for the neighborhoods in which we live. Meanwhile, Lee expressed his hope to see Israel and Palestine resume direct negotiations and make progress in their conflict. The Singaporean leader acknowledged a very complex situation and called for Israel to hold direct negotiations with the Palestinians that will ensure progress toward a just and durable solution to this long-standing and often, unfortunately, violent conflict. We've cons consistently believed that a two-state solution between Israel and Palestine, however hard to achieve, is the only way to bring peace and security to both peoples and to the Middle East. I told the Prime Minister this Last year when we met, it's still our view, and today the Prime Minister updated me on developments, and his reasons for being cautiously optimistic about things, and I explained Singapore's position again, and expressed my hope for peace between Israel and Palestine, and we hope that it will contribute to a stabler Middle East and a stabler world. Netanyahu wrapped up his 36-hour visit to Singapore on Tuesday that focused on economic and security issues and headed to Sydney. Despite warm relations with Singapore, Netanyahu's visit was kept low-key. His meeting with Singapore Prime Minister Lee Shen Lung only appeared on page 9 of Singapore's main English newspaper. 
Singapore, according to diplomatic officials, did not want to overly highlight the visit so as to not antagonize neighboring Malaysia and Indonesia, Muslim-majority states with which Israel has no diplomatic ties. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha Television. Well, a quick visit to Singapore done, Netanyahu then headed to Australia, which turned out to be a more controversial visit as compared to the quiet response from Malaysia and Indonesia when he was in Kuala Lumpur. The Israeli Prime Minister praised his Australian counterpart Malcolm Turnbull for calling out the hypocrisy of the United Nations, while Turnbull rebuked the UN for adopting what he labelled one-sided resolutions that are critical of Israel's settlements in Palestinian territories. Here's a report. Australia rolled out a warm red carpet 21-gun salute welcome on Wednesday to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. The first ever visit by a sitting Prime Minister to Australia whose friendship toward Israel dates back a century. Honored to be the first Israeli Prime Minister to officially visit Australia. God, it's been a long time coming. <laughs> and it's, uh, uh, it celebrates really uh, 100 years of friendship of Australia to the Jewish people and their state. Using words like miracle and envy of the world to describe Israel, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull greeted Netanyahu and his wife Sarah on the lush lawns of Admiralty House in Sydney, the residence of Australia's Governor General. Turnbull reaffirmed Australia's commitment to a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict on Wednesday, but said the government would not join those seeking to chastise Israel alone for the failure of that peace process. We do not support one-sided resolutions which uh, uh, condemn or criticise Israel of that kind. We, don't, we haven't done in the past and we won't in the future. Uh, it's a complex problem. It needs to be resolved by direct negotiations between the parties. Uh, and we certainly encourage that. Uh, so that's our, that is our position and it's, uh, it's been consistent. We are a very committed friend of Israel. We are a very consistent friend. Meanwhile, speaking about a possible resolution to the Arab-Israeli conflict, Netanyahu said that Israel wants the Palestinians to have all the power to govern themselves, but not the military or physical power to threaten it. The question of a Palestinian state, he said, repeating his statement from last week's visit to Washington, was not over labels, but rather over substance. It's not conceivable that people will say the Palestinians should have a state and continue to call for the uh, annihilation of the Jewish state, Israel. So, obviously, asking uh, the Palestinians to recognize uh, a Jewish state is, uh, is mandatory, and people must do that. Secondly, we know that in the realities of the Middle East, if Israel... Uh, is not there to ensure security, then that state very quickly will become, uh, uh, will become a, another bastion of uh, radical Islam. So this is what I've been talking about. Israel for decades has pursued a policy of constructing Jewish settlements on territory captured by it in a 1967 war with its Arab neighbors including the West Bank, Gaza and East Jerusalem. Most countries view Israeli settlement activity in the West Bank and East Jerusalem as illegal and an obstacle to peace. Israel disagrees, citing a biblical connection to the land. The two-state solution has long been the bedrock of Washington and the international community's policy for a settlement between Israel and the Palestinians. Trump's apparent loosening of a main tenet of U.S. Middle Eastern policy at a joint news conference with Netanyahu last week stunned the international community. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha Television. And finally, Bao Bao, the American-born giant panda, has begun its new life in China. The three-year-old landed in the city of Chengdu on Wednesday after a 16-hour-long flight. Bao Bao, whose name means precious or treasure, will first go through a month-long quarantine where her diet and health will be monitored. We're leaving you with these visuals. I'll see you next week.